Hi, I'm Dr. Kristen Coles. I'm a naturopathic physician and a licensed acupuncturist. Today's presentation is a discussion regarding the dietary approaches to treating and supporting SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Just a disclaimer, this information should not be used to diagnose yourself or to treat a health problem or disease. And if you are not a patient of mine, please seek your own personalized medical advice with a licensed physician. Let's start briefly with a little bit of information about what SIBO is. SIBO stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth, but I will be referring to it as SIBO since that is quicker and shorter to say. And essentially this is a condition where bacteria have gained access into the small intestine where they should not be located. It's an improper uh, overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. Actually, the majority of our bacteria or microbiome should be located in the large intestine, which is a different organ. The small intestine has a very specific role and function in our body. It should receive the contents that come from the stomach that are partially or fully digested and then complete digestion into and breakdown into individual components of nutrition should occur. So we should have amino acids, which are breakdown from proteins. We should have fatty acids, which are breakdown from fats. And we should have the specific types of sugars and carbohydrates breakdown from carbohydrates. Then we have our vitamins, our minerals, and our nutrients. And all of these are going to need to be absorbed in the small intestine. So that our small intestine is the organ that does the absorption of our nutrients and our vitamins and our minerals. So it is integral to the overall health and function of our entire body. SIBO can arise from many different causes. It can arise due to low stomach acid or drugs or medications that suppress stomach acid. It can arise from other types of drugs or medications that slow down or delay the ability of the entire GI system to function. It can also arise due to improper microbiome or bacterial situations in the large intestine. It can also arise from surgery or adhesions, abdominal surgeries that occur or adhesions that may occur in the um, abdomen area. And then of course it can be due to your own specific anatomy and other types of situations. As I was discussing earlier, SIBO can lead to vitamin deficiencies. It can lead to malabsorption and it can lead to um, poor nutrition. That's because of the difficulty or inability to absorb those crucial things that might be coming in from your diet or even from supplements you're taking, you may not be able to be absorbed. I diagnose this commonly every, every week. I diagnose SIBO in my practice and the diagnosis is almost exclusively done via a lactulose challenge breath test that is done and that breath test will look for hydrogen or methane gas production that is coming from the bacteria that are living or taking over in the small intestine. And that leads me to the next part about what SIBO is, which is talking about what are the symptoms associated with SIBO. And the most common symptoms are going to be gas. So that can be burping 
It can be farting. It can be just the expansion or the bloating of the gas. And so then bloating, uh, discomfort or pain in the abdomen, heartburn, and then very commonly, there's going to be some sort of stool irregularity that occurs. It could be diarrhea, it could be constipation, or it could be mixed. These symptoms are all due to the gas that is being produced by those bacteria that are in the small intestine. And the most common are going to be hydrogen or methane producing or a combination bacteria. How do we go about treating SIBO? If you see me for SIBO treatment, you're going to find that we're taking a multi-dimensional type of approach. Um, I do use oral antibiotics that are very specific to SIBO. They're not just any type of antibiotic. They're actually a bit of a different type of antibiotic that will work just in the small intestine. Um, I will often use those and then I will often combine it with herbs that are known as herbal antimicrobials. So they also, these herbs have the impact or the effect of being able to kill off the bacteria as well. And then I will often use some sort of dietary intervention, which is basically what this talk is focusing on, which is how do you go about doing what I call a SIBO specific diet. So the diet can be used any time throughout the process. The diet itself, the SIBO specific diet, is mostly utilized to manage the symptoms. So the symptoms being the gas, the bloating, the pain, the discomfort. The diet itself as a standalone treatment will not kill the bacteria and resolve the SIBO. We have to utilize some sort of other way to kill the bacteria, hence why there's oral antibiotics, herbal antimicrobials. There's a few other options that I will use in there, but the diet, what we have to remember is that the diet is used for symptom management. So there are times when I may use the diet in the beginning stages. There may be times when I don't use the diet and then there may be times when we're using the diet long-term. The specific thing to remember is that the bacteria that are the cause of SIBO are able to ferment carbohydrates. And these can be carbohydrates found in grains or carbs. These can be carbohydrates found in different vegetables or fruits. They can be carbohydrates found in dairy products. So there's a lot of different carbohydrates or sugars that will cause this fermentation process from the bacteria. And that's where we're looking at addressing the dietary sources of those fermentable carbohydrates. So I think it's important to know that when we're talking about how well does the diet work, we do have some good statistics in that upwards of 40 to 75 percent of patients who are diagnosed with SIBO may have ongoing or recurrent bouts of SIBO as they go through life. Even after the initial, the very first antibiotic treatment, 40% of patients with SIBO may still have symptoms. So that's where the diet comes in to help manage those symptoms as we continue to treat the infection. And then 40 to 75% of patients may have a recurrent episode of SIBO within nine months of an antibiotic treatment. Now, this statistic is looking at individuals who only do 10 to 14 days of antibiotics. In my practice, I do that. Very, I do it very differently. My patients never 
only do antibiotics. We're always doing antibiotics in combination with then a follow-up with herbs, a follow-up with a prokinetic, and a follow-up with diet. So my statistics are better than this, but this is the sort of average statistic for someone who's only doing antibiotic treatment. We do know that patients who adhere to a SIBO-specific diet will see significant improvement and reduction in their symptoms. So how does the diet help? Well, essentially, if we are going to be restricting the types of carbohydrates that are fermented by the bacteria, we are essentially starving the bacteria of their primary types of food, and they can no longer take that fermentable food and create huge amounts of gas. So less gas is going to mean less pain, less bloating, less burping, less farting, less diarrhea, less constipation. Let's take a look at the different types of dietary interventions that can be utilized. So there's three main types that we can think about or talk about. There is low FODMAP, there is the specific carbohydrate diet or the SCD diet, and then there is what I call the SIBO specific diet. Now, the SIBO specific diet is what I I'm almost always using and recommending. And what's really interesting is that the SIBO specific diet is a combination, a fusion of low FODMAP and specific carbohydrate diet. I'll talk a little bit more about the low FODMAP and specific carbohydrate. Basically in low FODMAP, we're lowering the fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. That's what FOD map stands for. So this is removing specific types of short chain carbohydrates. The, these types of carbohydrates are difficult to digest and they can be quickly fermented by the gut bacteria, which causes symptoms. So we're really looking at these very specific types of short chain carbohydrates and removing them in low FODMAP. Versus the specific carbohydrate diet, where we're actually limiting most disaccharides and all starches. So in this diet, all grains, starch heavy foods, and soft dairy products are eliminated. So again, these are carbs that are going to feed the bacteria and cause symptoms. Then we get to the SIBO specific diet, which is a combination of low FODMAP and the specific carbohydrate diet, which is designed specifically for SIBO patients. So the list of foods that are included in the removal is, is broader because we're looking at multiple and almost all different types of fermentable carbohydrates for the SIBO diet. And if we look at the efficacy, it's quite interesting. This is specific efficacy for SIBO. So the SIBO specific diet, where we're doing a combo of low FODMAP and the specific carbohydrate diet, has a potential to have a 75 to 90% reduction in symptoms. So it has the highest efficacy for use in SIBO, hence why this is exclusively what I use. The specific carbohydrate diet may reduce symptoms 60 to 75%, so that can still be effective, but certainly nothing like up to a 90%. Um, and specific carbohydrate diet you may hear of in other sort of situations like inflammatory bowel disorders being more effective. And then low FODMAP kind of depends on how effective it is. It may be a better choice for a standalone pure IBS case. So let's talk about the details of the SIBO-specific diet. If you are my patient, you have most likely received this SIBO-specific diet guide packet from me. I have it displayed here on the screen. What we are looking at here is a color-coded way to pick and choose the foods that are going to be SIBO safe. 
So this is the SIBA specific diet food guide. You can see that we have the green zone, a yellow zone, an orange zone, and a red zone. And what I really love about this is that it kind of shows us specifically what foods are SCD legal and low FODMAP. So the combo of those two diets are gonna be in the green zone versus the orange is going to be a high FODMAP food and SCD legal but then the red zone is gonna be the SCD illegal. When it comes to how I have my patients follow the SIBO specific diet, I want my patients eating out of the green zone as much as possible and some yellow. I want to avoid the red and the, or the orange and the red zone. So you can see vegetables and fruits here. And um, you can also see that there's some interesting notations on the portion sizes. And one of the most common questions I get from patients is, do I need to pay attention to the portion sizes? And I will say, yes, you do. Reason being is that this is a the load, the entire load of carbohydrates that are going in is going to depend, it's going to sort of be the basis of how fermentable that particular meal is going to be for you. So for instance, Brussels sprouts, two of them would be in the green zone, but six of them will put you in the orange zone. And these um, amounts are per meal, not per day. That's another common question I get. So for instance, you could have two Brussels sprouts for lunch and you could have another two Brussels sprouts for dinner. Here we have legumes and beans category. We have the nuts and seeds. We have the dairy category and we have the protein and the meats. Uh, it's important to note that meat proteins tend to be uh, very SIBO safe. Uh, they are not fermentable unless they have additives like bacon with high fructose corn syrup or processed deli meats, which have sugar or carrageenan or other gums, those tend to be very problematic. The other thing I do want to make note of is that those gums or those food thickeners or additives in general are considered very illegal in the red zone. You can see here under nuts and seeds, coconut milk is in the green zone if it has no thickeners included in the ingredient label. But if it has any thickeners, which many, many of them do, guar gum, carrageenan, these are some of the most common, those are going to be very problematic. Same goes with almond milk or rice milk or oat milk or any of your non-dairy milk alternatives. Um, you're going to need to be looking at the label and the list of ingredients to make sure that there are not any thickeners or gums included. Sweeteners are here. Beverages and alcohol you can read about in your handout. Then we have our fats and our oils, which I also want to note that fats and oils in their pure form are completely not fermentable. So um, things like olives and olive oils and um, different types of coconut oils, things like that are gonna be great calorie sources and they are going to be very easy on the gut for the digestion. Um, the only one that's going to be one that you wanna avoid is soybean oil. Then we have different um, seasonings and you can see here, this is where the gums, carrageenan thickeners are listed. So you wanna pay attention, spices to pay attention to, onion and garlic powder it can be very problematic. So you'll have noticed if you have gone through the dietary guide that there's not a page that talks about grains or carbohydrates. Um, reason being is that they're all illegal. Um, the only one that I am okay to add in can be white rice because white rice 
is absorbed so quickly in the very, very early part of the small intestine that most of the time it does not reach the bacteria in order to be fermented. So one of the things that I am often recommending is that individuals who are concerned with their energy level or concerned with having ex too much or excessive weight loss, if they cut the carbs, they should be including a half a cup of white rice per meal as needed. Uh, one of the things is that many times patients with SIBO come to see me and they've already had a lot of weight loss, too much weight loss potentially because they haven't been able to eat or tolerate foods. So we want to make sure that we're preserving our weight um, as we continue to reduce symptoms and utilize the diet. There are some really great resources now out there with different um, recipes and kind of creative ways to still feel like you're able to have breakfast foods and things like that. Um, the SIBO friendly pancakes, excellent recipe. Uh, you can make them ahead of time and then you can save them and have them sort of, you know, for a few days for a breakfast or, you know, a meal option. Uh, there's things like quiches with a squash crust, uh, a blueberry banana smoothie that would be SIBO safe and friendly. And um, there's links here included. Lunch and dinner tend to be a little bit more easy. Um, you know, if you're doing protein, you can usually figure out options, but here's a recipe for lemon baked salmon. There's slow cooker chicken and rice. There's zucchini noodles with pesto. Um, so these, you know, have some great resources for you. When we are looking at treating and dealing with SIBO and healing the gut, it does take time. And with the SIBO specific diet, we're obviously going to go through a period of where we're eliminating or we're removing those fermentable illegal foods. But eventually we do hope that we can cure the SIBO, reduce the bacteria, and then start to add foods back in. So that's when we start to reintroduce foods that were limited. And then, you know, the other thing that we keep in mind is that sometimes we have to do further personalization on these diets. Um, you know, there might be patients where we have done food sensitivity testing in the past, and we know that they can't tolerate foods like almonds or eggs. So those are going to be foods that they would obviously also have to remove, even if it's on a SIBO safe green zone list, because there's always other components that can play a role in an individual's ability to heal. So that's why working with your physician who's well-versed in SIBO is going to be very helpful. I have a few last additional comments that have to do with how to make it most successful when you're doing the dietary interventions. And one of the things that we know is extremely important is a meal spacing and meal timing. We want to make sure that you're spacing your meals four to five hours apart and you are not snacking in between. We also wanna fast for 10 to 12 hours overnight and ideally wait at least two hours after eating before going to bed. The reason this meal spacing is so important is that part of the situation that has arisen in the SIBO condition is that a part of our nervous system that lives in the gut, which is called the migrating motor complex or the MMC, this migrating motor complex has to activate to allow the um, peristalsis, which is the movement, the smooth muscle movement, the squeezing of the small intestine and the large intestine to push the items through we need to allow that to occur so that we don't have backup that's occurring that leads to stagnation and leads to more bacteria hanging out in the small intestine. We wanna clear all of the food from the small intestine before we eat again. And it takes four to five hours in between meals without snacking for that to occur. 
The other thing to remember that the portion size does matter. So the small amounts of individual foods may be tolerated when larger amounts aren't. So pay close attention to those um, portion components in terms of what keeps you in the green or the yellow zone. And it's, you know, eventually as we're adding carbs back in, we may even find that carbs can be tolerated. It's not a yes or a no, but it's a how much and how often. I also want to remind my patients to check their supplements in case there are common SIBO triggers included, like fiber supplements. Those are going to be problematic for SIBO because certain fibers are very fermentable but also any type of prebiotic supplement or probiotic. I do recommend that patients who are treating SIBO stop all probiotics and prebiotics during the duration of the treatment. So that concludes the discussion of how to do the SIBO specific diet. If you do have any questions, please reach out to me or reach out to your individual physician. Thank you and good luck.